Hello everyone, in this video I will discuss the M plus output file for a latent transition analysis. My name is Christian Geiser, on this channel I present weekly statistics tutorials often related to the M plus software and multivariate statistical methods such as structural equation models or latent class models. If this is something that interests you then please subscribe to this channel. Also don't forget to hit the like button and to leave a comment in the comment section. In this video here, I want to discuss the most important aspects of an M plus output file for a latent transition analysis. If you are more interested in latent class and latent transition analysis, then also please check out the description for my playlist on latent class models on this channel here, as well as workshops that I offer on latent class analysis, latent profile analysis, and latent transition analysis. In these workshops, I discuss all the details in M+, all the specification in greater detail, as well as specific models and modeling issues. So here in this video, I'm going to focus on the key points with latent transition analysis and the output in M+. I have another video in which I described the input file or syntax file for a latent transition analysis that you can also find in the description. So if you don't know the M plus syntax yet, then please refer to that video here. In this video, I'm going to focus on the output file. So this is what you can see here. This is the output file with the syntax commands here reproduced. I'm not going to go over these again, because as I said, I have a separate video in which I discuss the syntax here in detail. So let's scroll down and take a look at what we can obtain in an M plus output file. So the first thing that we should always check with for any analysis is in, in M plus is that we get this message here, input reading terminated normally, which indicates that there weren't any basic syntax errors or problems with our specification. So this looks good. And then M plus reproduces our title, latent transition analysis, and provides us with a summary of the uh, sample and variables. And so here you can see that the sample size that was used here was 519. We had 24 dependent variables. In this case, those are our indicator variables for the latent transition analysis. It was a la latent transition analysis with two time points. Therefore, we have two categorical latent variables here. And the indicators were also categorical. In this case, they were binary. And so the binary um, indicators are listed here. You can see that there were a total of 24 variables that were used as latent class indicators, 12 items at time one and 12 items at time two. The same items were measured on two time points. And for those of you who have not watched the syntax video on this analysis, those items are from a mental rotations test, a test of spatial abilities. And so the idea here is to look at transitions of mental rotation classes, so to say, performance classes to see um, what types of mental rotations performers could be distinguished and how those performers develop across time or how they transition from one class into another across time. So this is the summary of the analysis that allows you to check your sample size, allows you to check that you use the right variables that you meant to use and um, to look at the categorical latent variables as well. So they were named C1 and C2 here. C1 is the latent class variable for time one and C2 is the latent class variable for time two. So after that, we get some technical information about the estimation here. The estimator that M plus uses by default is robust maximum likelihood estimation. So MLR is the abbreviation for that estimator. And you can see some convergence criteria here as well that M plus uses by default. I'm not going to go into the details of that here. Um, I want to show you what you get in terms of the key output for a latent transition analysis. And so the first thing that you get is a summary of the observed variables. So some descriptive statistics on the binary variables. And you can see for each item, you get the proportions in each category. For example, the first item at time one is MRT pretest, so MRT PR1. And so this item was one where 
56.1% did not solve this item. So they had a score in category one, which means item not solved. And then the remaining 43.9% had a score in category two. So they did solve the item. So this item was about 50-50, a little less than 50-50 in terms of its overall solution probability for all classes. So say combined or for all individuals combined and, and plus also gives the sample size or the group size for each category. So 291 subjects um, did not solve this item in our sample and 200 28 individuals did solve this item. So you can look at item difficulties, so to say overall, and um, look at which items were particularly difficult. No, of note here, you can see that the last few items here, so each at each time point there were 12 items. So the last few items here had noticeably um, lower solution probabilities. You can see that here most individuals fall into category one, so not solved. And so that's because these I, this test was speeded. So there was a pretty substantial speed component where individuals tended to run out of time with um, when they worked through this test. So the last few items had therefore low probabilities of being solved by anybody because the test was pretty highly speeded. And so you can see this here at time one. So MRT pre nine through MRT pre 12, they have um, over or around 0.90 or slightly below 0.90 probability of not getting solved. And then at time two, it's a little better. It's looking a little better. So individuals then um, were faster or they got, got better at the test. And so the solution probabilities here are slightly higher. So just so that you can see what M plus gives us in terms of descriptive statistics for the items. And then after that, we get a summary of the log likelihood values for different sets of starting values. M plus for a mixture analysis by default uses multiple sets of random starting values so that we can avoid local maxima. I have a separate video on how to avoid local maxima in latent class and latent transition and latent profile analysis and other mixture models on this channel that you can check out as well if you're more interested in that topic. So here, this simply means that the best log likelihood value, which is listed at the top here, has been replicated multiple times. You can see that this is given here for four different sets of starting values. And so that's overall a good sign that we were able to find the same log likelihood value with multiple sets of starts. Now, for an actual analysis, um, you want to probably run more than the M plus default starting values to make sure that this best log likelihood value is still replicated with more sets of starting values. And this is actually what this mes message here is about. So M plus warns you that you should potentially increase the number of starts beyond the M plus default, especially for a complex model and then make sure that the best log likelihood value is still obtained and replicated when you run more starts. And as I said, um, if you want to learn how that works, then please check out my video on this channel about how to avoid local maxima in mixture models in M plus, where I show how you can increase the number of starts in the M plus syntax. Next is a message that is also very important to check. And that's the message about the model estimation terminating normally. If there was any estimation problem with your model, then that would be indicated here. So it's a good sign if you find this message, the model estimation terminated normally, and then you want to check that there's no additional message or that would signal some sort of estimation problem. So here there is an additional message and that message says that chi-square test cannot be computed because the frequency table for the latent class indicator model is too large. And so this means that normally M plus would give you a Pearson chi-square statistic and a likelihood ratio statistic for latent class and latent transition models with binary or ordinal indicators and those chi-square statistics could be used to test the model fit. However, in this case with 24 items and only a sample slightly larger than 500 cases, the chi-square test cannot be computed because there are too many empty cells in the frequency table. There are too many response patterns that are 
um, that have low frequencies. And so in that case, those chi-square statistics would be misleading and they wouldn't be valid anyway. And so therefore M plus does not compute them and doesn't print them because they could be um, mis misinterpreted and they wouldn't be relevant, so to say, for our um, goodness of fit assessment. So in this case, when you have so many items and um, a sample that is not so large, then you would have to resort to other means of model fit assessment. In my workshops on latent class and latent transition analysis, I discuss model fit statistics in uh, great detail for assessing the fit of different latent class and latent transition models and for comparing different models. One way to do this is by looking at the information criteria that are given here and for example compare the BIC statistics for different models. In this case we have a two class latent transition analysis model. So at each time point there are two classes and you can see here that what M plus gives you next after the model fit information is the class size parameters. So what you find here in this section under final class counts and proportions for each latent class variable based on the estimated model are the class proportion parameters. Those are model parameters that are being estimated and you can see here that at time one class one comprised about 26% of individuals, whereas class two comprised about 74% of individuals, whereas at time two, the class sizes were more even, so were more, more equal. Uh, here class one was slightly larger than class two at time two. Now, of course, we don't necessarily know the order of the classes, so we have to, or we don't know what class, which class is which yet. So we have to look at our latent class indicator parameters, the um, item parameters to understand what the classes here mean. So for now, we just learn that at time one, class one is um, about one quarter of the sample and class two is estimated to be comprised of three quarters of the individuals, whereas at time two, it's about 50-50. When we scroll down, we find the latent class indicator means and probabilities for each latent class. So those give you the profiles. And in this case, those are not means, but they are probabilities more accurately, so to say, stated, because in this case, we don't have continuous latent class indicators, but we have binary indicators. And so what M plus then estimates as, um, indic as um, item parameters are the conditional response probabilities conditional on class membership. And first are the probability profiles given for time one. So for the latent class variable C1, and you can see here that latent class one is characterized by high probabilities for the second category, whereas Class two is characterized by lower probabilities for the second category, as you can see here. So this means that class one at time one can be interpreted as a high performing class, uh, whereas class two would be considered a low performing class. So it's a split into high versus low in this case, which we often find when we extract a two class model or two class solution. So th that's how those two classes differ. Class two, class one, excuse me, shows higher performance than class two. And so let's take a look at the C2 profile. And you can see that the conditional response probabilities here are actually the same. And that's because they've been set equal across time for measurement equivalence. So you can see that here we have again, point, a probability of 0.855 for category two in class one the same that we had here for the same item and a probability of 0.315 for category two in class two for the first item. That's the same probability that we had here. And so this is because those conditional response probabilities were set equal across time. And so therefore the, the classes come in the same order at both time points. And this shows you that um, while at time one, the high performing class is pretty small or was pretty small. That same class is then much bigger at time two. So there was a lot of improvement in terms of more people being assigned 
to the high performing class at time two as compared to time one. So quite a bit of transitioning happen he happening here because now this class is slightly over half the size of the group of the sample, whereas here it was only a, about a quarter. And so this should be reflected then also in the latent transition probabilities, which are given next by M plus. And you can see here that class one was very stable. So uh, the probability of staying in class one over time was 97%. And that makes sense because if you master that skill of mental rotation ability, then there's really not a good reason why you should perform less well at the second time point, unless there was some sort of cognitive decline happening maybe in an older population. Here, this wasn't an older population. This was actually a, a student population. And so there's really no reason why people should get worse at this test over time, other than if they were maybe not motivated or maybe they had a bad day, but really cognitively they should become they should become better over time rather than worse. So it makes sense that class one is very stable. The probability of staying in this high performing class is almost one. There's only a 3% chance of transitioning to the lower performing class over time. In contrast, the lower performing class two has a lower stability. So there's a high chance of those individuals transitioning over to the higher performing class. You can see here the chance of that happening is 0.373. So 37% of individuals who were in class two at time one transitioned over to the higher performing class. So that is showing, so say that progress and that explains why the class sizes differ so substantially between C1 and C2 because so many people migrated over to class one from class two over time, reflecting their increased performance over time. So that's the key, um, or this is one of the key things that you wanna look at when you run a latent transition analysis because that reflects change over time. It's reflected in those transition probabilities. The classes as such here are held constant. So we have the same class structures over time and any change then is reflected in the transition probabilities here which show how likely individuals are to stay in the same class over time versus migrate to another class. I hope you liked this video. If you want to learn more about latent class and latent transition analysis, then please check out the description for additional videos and workshops that I offer. Also, feel free to check out other links in the description to my weekly newsletter, for example. And um, don't forget to subscribe to this channel, hit the like button, and I'll see you next week.